thank you sir for such a kind such a gracious uh, words uh, i'm grateful to you for this wonderful opportunity to visit this great institution and i say great uh, based on the conversation that i had during the last couple of hours but more importantly your uh, reputation travels far and wide i can tell you before i came here i was told about uh, the excellence and <coughs> relevance of this uh, uh, institution and uh, that impression has got consolidated in the morning and uh, i must specially acknowledge your dynamic leadership visionary leadership uh, uh, which uh, actually is uh, transformative as far as the spirits of any institution are concerned when you have such a, a far reaching view of uh, the future uh, i am going to focus on a topic which is very very i would say hot today if i can use that word uh, just after you left at 9:50 out of curiosity i uh, went on the internet and uh, clicked on uh, my ted lecture uh, where i had spoken about more from less for more for the first time and uh, it is unbelievable that uh, the two years that it has been on the net this particular lecture i had called it gandhi in engineering at that time more from less for more uh, as we speak there have been uh, 3 lakh 86000 uh, 576 hits i mean at the views here just in two years so by the time i begin and i finish i think around 500 people around the world would have again visited uh, that lecture why i'm mentioning that not because of uh, the number but the kind of interest in this subject today around the world uh, that i wanted to really highlight and you will soon see why this innovations holy grail more from less for more has uh, become a hot topic around the world now normally when we talk about uh, innovation and i must very fondly recollect my first lecture on innovation was uh, when my good friend Uh, Bimal Jalan, when he was the Reserve Bank Governor, had invited me to uh, give a talk in Reserve Bank of India. It was a memorial lecture, and that was also on innovation. Uh, but uh, I must say that it was a different kind of innovation. I had not talked in terms of the kind of topic that I am uh, discussing today with you. And that part of the innovation was really exclusive innovation, which actually is. getting more performance by using more resources and when you are using more resources obviously you will price it more isn't it if something costs you more you will price it also more so what it means is that it is available for less and less people okay so the current paradigm in terms of exclusive innovation is one where you spend a lot of money all right create more and more expensive products and they are available for less and less people you have iphone 5 i'm sure iphone 6 will come iphone 7 will come they will become more and more expensive and less and less <coughs> people will be able to actually have them this has been the normal pattern now industrial enterprises they aim at getting more performance from less cost for more profit and this is well known i mean one doesn't have to give examples of that it is uh, Uh, very very clear but inclusive innovation which means including all those who are excluded and there are a large number of people who are excluded for a variety of reasons poverty being the most prominent one because when you have an income level which is less than 2 dollars per day and there are 2.6 billion people having that sort of a level your ability to buy or get access to anything is very small now how do you do an innovation by which you get them included rather than keeping them excluded that's the challenge and that is the subject of my talk today so it is about getting more performance from less resource for more and more people and this has 
now become famous as a MLM paradigm, by the way. Uh, from less resource means it is more and more affordable. And more performance means it leads more and more towards excellence. So actually you are talking about a contradiction in terms of affordable excellence. Normally, as soon as something is affordable, we say it can't be excellent. And as soon as something is excellent, we say it can't be affordable, right? Now, how do you bring these two together? I think it's a magic, and that magic is something India excels in, as I will show you later. Let us understand it a bit better. On the x-axis, you have price. And on the y-axis, your performance, right? Now, very high price <coughs> means very high performance, right? And that is where excellence lies. High price, high performance. But if you have very low price, <coughs> very low performance, then therein lies the affordable part, isn't it? Now, the trick is, at a very low price, how can you get high performance? Then you reach the quadrant of affordable excellence. Therefore, we have been used to remaining in this quadrant, very high price, very high performance. From there, how do we move into affordable excellence? The second is that at low price, low performance, we have been in this quadrant, how do we move in this quadrant? What do you need to do? Because there is uh, uh, something by way of innovation that comes in uh, in order that you are able to achieve such seemingly impossible objective. I remember writing a paper with uh, C.K. Prahlad on innovation's holy grail, more from less for more, in Harvard Business Review, July, August 2010. This paper is now ranked among the top 10 must-read papers in innovation. And in the survey that was done in July, this was ranked as number one, by the way. Now, there what we actually did was something very simple. What we said was scarcity on one hand and aspiration on the other hand is something that India has always had. But we have to recognize that the combination of scarcity and aspiration together has a deadly connotation because it's first innovation. You are scarce on resources, but you still have an aspiration for very high quality. Okay? And that was the crux of this uh, paper as to how Indians have dealt with this uh, sort of paradox of high aspirations in the presence of scarcity to create uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, new space in innovation. In fact, this paper appeared in July, August 2010, and World Economic Forum actually, within six months, had a special session on more from less for more. You know, because they were able to spot the importance of this in terms of uh, uh, what impact it is going to have. And the real reason for that is this, really. Uh, I was in China uh, this June, and uh, there was a mission on this inclusive innovation. I was a part of it, and I was looking at what's happening in China. China is economically growing. There is no problem about that in understanding that. But there is a price that they are paying for the rapid economic growth, which is uh, the fact that the Gini index of income inequality is growing very rapidly. Okay? That means inequality between the top and the bottom. And you can see the difference here in these two graphs that are projected. In fact, if you look at the top 10%, uh, uh, they have a 34.6% share of the economy. And the bottom 10% has 2.4%. 34 plus 2 plus. Okay? And this gap is increasing over a period of time. What do you want? Actually, yeah. Sorry? Only the oh, no, no, no. The, these graphs have to be shown. Yeah. Why, yes, to be. Hmm. I didn't realize that. Yeah, but you have a very mental picture. No, no, no. I think 
they must see the graphs. I can't be in this area. Yeah. This is this is what I was talking about. Do you want me to go through again? You are sure? All right. <laughs> then you have not seen my photograph with uh, CK Prasad. <laughs> Uh, this you missed, isn't it? You can't imagine this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, no, let me. Uh, no, I, I think it has to be perfect. Just sorry, I I I'll have to uh, uh, sort of go through this. Let me do it very fast. This is the title of my talk, and I'm saying exclusive innovation is getting more performance from more resource for less people, and industrial enterprises aim at getting more performance from less cost for more profit and value to the shareholder. And I'm contrasting this with inclusive innovation, getting more performance from less resource for more and more people. And I'm saying that from less resource means it's making affordable, getting more performance means excellence, and the contradiction in terms of affordable excellence that comes up. And then I'm saying that if you look at uh, the price performance envelope, you are in this quadrant of excellence with high price, high performance, otherwise affordable in this quadrant. And I'm saying that we need to move towards affordable excellence. That is, at low price, very high performance. And I'm saying that movement has to be from this quadrant to this, and this quadrant to this. How do you make that happen? I think that is uh, uh, the basic issue. And then I mentioned to you about my writing a paper with C.K. Prahlad on Innovation's Holy Grail, and World Economic Forum within six months, having this session on more from less for more. Okay? So now we are all up to date. And then I'm saying, that income disparity in China, I'm saying how the Gini coefficient is increasing and how the top and the bottom are going farther and farther up. And they are very worried because this will lead to social disharmony. And that has become their great concern. And I remember this major symposium where I gave the plenary, and you can see my Chinese friends, Regional Inclusive Innovation Policy Forum. They are moving in, uh, very, very rapidly on this. And India is no different. India Gini index also, as you can see from this curve, is uh, uh, rising very rapidly. And the difference between the top and the bottom is also increasing. And we are going to have the same problems. And therefore, we have this challenge of great income inequality, which is uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, from, from which we are suffering. The other point I want to make is that the true inclusion of 2.6 billion people will not just uh, demand low cost, but ultra low cost. And this means not minor redesigning, but radical rethinking. All right, I want to emphasize this point and creative reinventing. <coughs> Let us say HIV AIDS drugs are available for $10,000 for a year's treatment, ARVs, antiretrovirals. So because you are poor, you can't say I will have 10% reduction. Right? They can't afford $9,000. They can't even afford uh, uh, $1,000. It has to be $100. So therefore, we are not talking about lower cost. We are looking at ultra low cost while maintaining excellence. Now, that is a big challenge. Now, affordable excellence, therefore, is not about stripping products and services to make them cheap. Somehow, it is about giving high quality at affordable prices. It is not doing jugaad. I don't know. I don't like the word jugaad, very frankly. India is getting a wrong image that we are very good at jugaad. In fact, I deferred with the cabinet minister on the other day on a public platform on this because he was preaching jugaad and I said I hate jugaad. Because jugaad is getting it somehow, cheaply, without any consideration to safety, without any consideration uh, to sustainability and so on and so forth. That's not the India that we want. The India that we want is affordable excellence. Excellence up front, all right? But at the same time, affordable. Now, uh, if you go forward, affordable excellence, I'll give some examples to illustrate the point. Hepatitis B vaccine, all right? Recombinant DNA-based hepatitis B vaccine using very high technology. Can you make it 40 times cheaper? Not 40%, 40 times cheaper but of very high quality. It has been done. All right? 40% of UNICEF supply comes from this. A company called Shanta Biotech, an Indian company, did it. And you know about that company. Cataract eye surgery, 100 times cheaper. All right? Arvind Eye Care. Not $3,000, but $30. Mm -hmm. 
but quality very high all right better than the royal college of ophthalmic surgeons so affordable but excellent open heart surgery 20 times cheaper narayan rudalaya for example using workflow innovations of an incredible uh, kind but quality as good as in your hospitals affordable excellence and an artificial foot i'll come back to that a little later 300 times cheaper so they all look ridiculous because we are not talking about 40% cheaper 100% cheaper 20% cheaper we are talking about 40 times cheaper 100 times cheaper and so on and we have been able to achieve it these are no dreams it has been done now let's take a concrete example in terms of price performance in what if you look at uh, the excellence part of it very high price very high performance a mercedes right but very low price very low performance a bicycle now you can see this young man is carrying not only his weight but some other weight which will give him let's say the meals for the day okay but poor don't remain poor they become lower middle class and when they become lower middle class you have this scene you're carrying your entire family on a scooter just like we all laughed uh, everybody laughs but there was one person who did not laugh when he saw something like this not exactly this and he personally told me about it ratan tada in the rains he was driving his own car and he saw a mother delicately balancing the infant while the husband was driving and he said no why can i not for this price give them a car and that is that affordable excellence the tata nano now if you see small car was not something that was discovered for the first time by him it was there for example ford had it model t 20000 dollars Volkswagen eleven thousand dollars, Beetle, uh, British Motor Corporation had eleven thousand dollars, Mini, but what he created was two thousand dollars. So therefore, in comparison to Model T, it was ten times cheaper, not ten percent cheaper. That was a radical sort of a breakthrough. In fact, Nano has been talked so much that there is a book called Nanovation, by the way, which have been written by an American pair, Kevin and Jackie. Uh, free work now you might say that uh, if uh, uh, nano is such a wonderful innovation how come it has not become a commercial success because it is not a commercial success so far the reason is obvious that innovation is end to end it's not just the technological excellence all right that technological excellence is such that can you imagine how many patents nano has 86 all right however there are certain fundamentals finally to the customer that matters isn't it like you were saying during your presentation now that customer one should realize doesn't go to the showroom the showroom has to come to him is a first time owner of a car not like you and me who keep on changing the cars every 1 2 3 years okay financing for example it doesn't uh, many of them don't have a bank account all right and you know what it means in terms of loan these that and the other so when it comes to a system delivery innovation technological innovation is one but finally in order to make the product affordable and reach the kind of customer that you have these things were just forgotten you know secondly when we talk about affordable excellence the excellence has to come at the front end and affordable has to come at the back end the moment you put affordable at the front end it has a connotation of cheap and who wants a cheap car all right so it was the excellence that should have been actually highlighted now they are trying to do that reposition nano you know city car and the rest of it i think the point i'm trying to make when you have innovations like this is that you can't just be happy with the technological innovation that you have done. you have to look at end to end all right in order to uh, sort of finally reach the masses so i want to highlight this point that affordable excellence technological innovation is just one part but business model innovation becomes very important then you have workflow innovation you have organizational innovation your research process innovation your system delivery innovation 
and your policy innovation. So you cannot look at achieving affordable excellence in isolation by just doing technological innovation. You have to use a combination of these. Let me just illustrate the point. You know, this is a, uh, you can see uh, a very beautiful, smart lady, Neo Rich, on one hand, and on the other hand, you have other side. You have uh, a lady from the slum. If you look at their income inequality, it may be thousand is to one, or maybe ten thousand is to one. Nothing common between them, but they still have access equality. What is that? Mobile. Now, if one were to say that you can create a condition where, despite income inequality, you will access equality, you will not have believed it, isn't it? Like affordable excellence is a contradiction. Similarly, income inequality, despite income inequality, access equality is also a contradiction. But you can see it happen here. Now the question is, what kind of innovation was involved in making that happen? And you will find that there was technological and business model innovation. For example, the handset which was $250 became $25, right? But whose innovation was it? Not India. There were Nokia, Ericsson, and so on and so forth. We can't take credit for that. But supposing this handset was uh, $25, very cheap, but phone call cost you 10 cents per minute, let us say, 8 to 10 cents per minute, like it does in the US, would that lady from the slum afford it? No. Because her income must be $2 a day. $2 is 200 cents a day. 200 cent and 10 cent uh, per minute means 20 minute call and day's earnings are gone. So therefore, you had to have the call rates not 10 cent but a fraction of a cent. And who did that? It was a business process innovation done by Reliance Airtel. Reliance, you remember, phone call at the cost of a postcard? That was something that Dhirubhai Ambani had advanced. And I remember talking to Mukesh Ambani and he telling me that when Papa made that statement, that we should have phone call at the cost of a postcard. It was all right for him to make the statement. We had to deliver. And he said, we had no idea. We were not in telecom. The only thing we knew was refining. So he said, we use refining model for telecom. And what was that? Not, uh, not uh, the sort of uh, cost per subscriber, cost for Erlang. Erlang was the uh, volume of traffic of voice per unit time. And that was a parallel drawn from barrels per day in refining. Okay? So they transported that model, and there were so, so many four or five other innovations by which these were brought down. And then Airtel, you know how they moved the CapEx to OpEx and all that. I mean, in fact, this has been covered as a, a case study in the paper that Harvard Business Review paper that I talked to you about. So those of you who are interested can see that. Main point I'm trying to make is the following. You have a technological innovation to create a $25 handset, that in itself would not have been good enough if there was no business model innovation coupled with it, which reduced the, uh, the sort of, uh, sort of call rates. So therefore, in practically every example that you take on inclusive innovation, you will find very clever thinking and end-to-end -end, uh, needs to be done in order to uh, make affordable excellence possible. Let's take this uh, workflow innovation, not $3,000, but $30, Arvind Aikya. What did they do? They increased surgeons' productivity, not the number of surgeons. And they use an assembly line technique of surgery, that is, increased productivity by a factor of 10. And they drew the inspiration from McDonald's, their assembly line uh, sort of approach, by the way. Their operating profits are more than 40%, but only 30% of the patients pay. Okay. <coughs> So it is not philanthropy, by the way. There is a business involved in that. That inclusive innovation has inclusive business where there is a profit. So one of the wrong perceptions we have always is that when you are operating in an inclusive innovation space, uh, you have to be philanthropic. No, sorry. Business goes along with it. I think it's something that we have to understand. Now they do around 300,000 cataract surgeries per year. And you will find that if the costs of doing the surgery are 100 times lower, then the quality must be 100 times worse, isn't it? No, sorry. Look at Royal College of Ophthalmologists in UK versus Arvind. And post-surgery went. 
capsule rupture or when it's twice as good iris trauma or when it's twice as good iris prolapse or when it's seven times as good anterior chamber collapse or when it's twice as good and i can go on so it is not delivering less from less it is delivering more from less all right affordable excellence i keep on repeating that the psoriasis treatment i mean let me stay in the health sector they cost more than a house is what uh, uh, the american medical association had said once so expensive so what we did when i was the dg of csir i created a program called nimitly new millennium indian technology leadership initiative the key word was leadership because i said in the entire 20th century india had failed to do one thing which is to create a product or create something which was first to the world not first to india all right and therefore we set up many grand challenges this was one of them so in the case of psoriasis treatment the cost of treatment was $20000 which i can do it in $100 ridiculous isn't it time for development about 10 years it used to take i said can we do it in 5 years and cost of development was few hundred million dollars i said we don't have that money can you do it in 10 million dollars all of them look absolutely ridiculous how do you achieve targets like this now it's very important to remember what sir francis bacon had said when you want to achieve results which have never been achieved before it is an unwise fancy to think that they can be achieved by using methods which have not been used before or in other words if you want to achieve something which has never been done before if you go on the same path as others have gone you will not be able to you have to take a different path altogether you understand use methods which have never been used before so what was the method that we used see normally you don't look at it like this but we said can we create a golden triangle of traditional medicine modern medicine modern science where in traditional medicine you have a number of clues you know with regard to what can possibly work because this has been done in laboratories of life and the standard drug delivery process for example discovery process is you look at a molecule put it into mice do regulatory toxicology and then put it into men right or in women which means uh, phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 clinical trials that is the normal pharmacology we said no we will do the reverse pharmacology it will be men to mice to men you get the point not molecule to mice to men this reverse pharmacology because it has been something has been proven in the field but not validated scientifically and clinically so you do that validation and then put it into men compressing the time targets compressing the 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 amount of money that you uh, sort of spend and so on and so forth and there is a treatment and you can see before treatment after treatment how does it work out this is indian psoriasis breakthrough today all right but mind you this would never have been possible if you had followed the same route okay so when you want to do a disruptive innovation like this and i will call it a disruptive one because it breaks the price performance barrier completely you have to follow methods which are completely different you can't expect them to achieve the results by following them. so how do you change your mindset to move from incremental to disruptive is one of the big challenge uh, i give examples of these affordable excellence and one of them i said research process innovation uh, csr i'm very proud to say my successor samir bhamachari has created this open source drug discovery what does this do previously the drug discovery would be always uh, say a multinational company is doing they will be doing internally within their group with their scientists and so on he has made it open source it was launched in september <coughs> 08 and now more than 4500 users from 130 countries so it is like a co creation you you get the point and amazingly 40 to 50% of them are young students by the way contributing to new drug development you know and you can see the partners <coughs> here including infosys and 
so on and so forth. With them, it is being done. And it's a completely different process. If you look at the innovation, <coughs> there is OSDD community targets, new molecules, known molecules. And if you look at the process part of it, how, for example, right from cloning to expression to assay, uh, it is being done completely differently using experience, low cost, globally competitive contract research organizations. So on innovation side, you are using the creativity of students and young researchers. And on the process side, you are using the experience of low cost, globally competitive contract research organizations. Completely different way of doing it. OSDD, I'm very happy to say, originated in India and it is first to the world. Not first to India, by the way, all right? And it has taken like a swarm. All along, I mean, you, you, you can just see the number of conferences that are being held. Okay? This is un unconventional, of course, uh, collaborative networks of right from management professionals to mathematicians to computational biologists. It's a big, big, big uh, sort of experiment that is going on. Uh, I've given you some glimpse of what I mean by inclusive innovation and more from less for more and frugal innovation is what we were talking about as we sort of uh, walked along. Nanovation is the word that you hired. Uh, 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 and uh, there are other words that are being used and this is a new dictionary by the way that is coming out. Five years ago these words did not exist in the dictionary of innovation and they are existing today because of India. I'm very proud that this is happening because of India. What are the drivers around the world? In the emerging economies, rising incomes and aspirations, but rising inequalities, leading to social disharmony. So obviously, they are very keen to address this. The challenge with rising inequalities in incomes is that you can't correct it overnight. A lower middle class cannot overnight become middle class, or a poor cannot overnight become a lower middle class. Takes a generation, right? Now until that time, what do you do? You wait? No, you can't. And therefore, despite those income inequalities, if you give them access equalities, whether it is education, whether it is health, whether it is other services like communication that you just now saw, you know, that is one way of approaching uh, basically the, the, the issue. So emerging economies, whether it is India, China, etc., all are very, very keen on this. But enterprises are also very keen because as poor become lower middle class, lower middle class become middle class. There's a new billion of customer that you suddenly start seeing. And what is the beauty of that new customer? These are people who want high quality products, but at affordable prices. So they have aspiration. All right. So therefore, to solve that, new consumers with rising incomes represent the next billion market. Everybody is interested. It's not just the Indian company. It's the European companies, it's the American companies. All of them are eyeing that. But for that, an American company, which is always used to getting more from more, suddenly has to start about getting more from less. And that's a cultural shift for them. More from less comes easily to India, not to them. Okay? And that's the big challenge, by the way. So, they are getting into it now. Why? Like Jeffrey Merritt, the CEO of GE says, if we do not come up with innovations in poor countries and take them global, new competitors from the developing world, the Minre, the Suzlon, the Goldwyn, will, and that's a blessing prospect. Or in other words, what he's saying is that we have no other option but to get into this. That also is a paradox, isn't it? I think basically what we would say is that they wouldn't bother about affordable excellence. They will be always talking about unaffordable excellence, isn't it? Catering to the top of the pyramid, not the base of the economic pyramid. But they are getting more. And therefore, the Harvard Business Review also had a paper which was called Reverse Innovation, which Jeffrey Mills wrote. <coughs> and in that reverse innovation, what he said was the following, like what you see here. Electrocardiograph machine was $10,000. G Healthcare said we can do it in $600 and they created one. Now it has to be high quality because with ECG you can't fool around. All right? You can't get it approximately right because one blip wrongly interpreted can give you wrong indication. So what was available for $10,000 you could create in $600? 
जी हेल्थ केयर इन चाइना दे अल्ट्रासाउंड मशीन विच आर थर्टी थाउजेंड डॉलर दे डिड इट फॉर फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड डॉलर एंड यू कैन सी हेयर जेफ्री मेड कैरिंग दैट ओके सो सच कंपनीज लाइक जी ई ना आर गेटिंग इन टू दिस एंड नॉट ओनली दैट अदर्स आर गेटिंग द नोकिया द पॉक एंड गैम्बल सीमेंस फोर्ड एंड सॉन आई वॉज टॉकिंग टू सीमेंस मैनेजिंग डायरेक्टर ऑफ द अदर डे दे हैव आउटलाइन समथिंग लाइक एटी बायोमेडिकल प्रोडक्ट्स एंड ही सेड दैट आई कांट सिंपली डू इट इन जर्मनी इट हैज टू बी डन इन इंडिया बिकॉज ही सेड इंडियन इंजीनियर्स हैव द स्पेशल माइंड सेट यू नो थिंकिंग फ्रूगली डूइंग इट राइट एंड सो ऑन सो फोर्थ Which to my German uh, counterpart, it just doesn't come. That is why many of these companies are now coming here, learning from here on how to get into this domain of affordable excellence. In fact, there are big plans. G plans to spend three billion dollars till 2015 to create at least 100 healthcare innovation that will substantially lower costs, increase access, and improve quality. Now it has. <coughs> another unintended consequence previously what used to happen europe us used to create very sophisticated products right with many many features then they will look at the developing world and say oh what can they afford and they will create knock down products isn't it dropping this functionality that functionality etc that was the normal innovation path now what is happening in that they are seeing the other way around that means products will be created here in india and then they will add on features to it for the developed world that is why the word reverse innovation okay the india and chinas of this uh, of this world so this is a paradigm shift by the way in the way things used to be done uh i want to now come to this issue about uh, you know we do science we do technology science gets converted to technology and then from technology to innovation okay now frontier innovation is what our universities do cutting edge science all right and then convert it into sort of a technology what is the difference between frontier innovation and inclusive innovation frontier innovation the driver is curiosity or market driven science and research but in inclusive innovation it is the application impact driven cost conscious science and research it's a completely different way of doing it so if our universities had to get into it they have to make a conceptual change in terms of the way their thinking goes frontier innovation is driven by sophisticated research capabilities <laughs> which is very popular among policy makers and science technology innovation community but when it comes to inclusive innovation it is driven by innovative entrepreneurs who are faced with challenge of scarcity and aspiration and businesses varying from markets and uh, uh, in emerging economies so the drivers are very different if you look at the markets that the frontier innovation addresses is a well established route from idea to product to market it is well set by the way but that is not the case you have have to find out new routes to not yet established markets okay because you are talking about something completely different similarly if you look at margins in frontier innovation there are high r&d investments and they are recouped by long lasting premiums isn't it if you have spent a lot of money then you have to have high margins and you have to recover it from few people but that is not the case in inclusive innovation product the margins are very low basically all right high volume low margin products and services india today has let's say 800 to 900 million mobiles i don't have the exact number but of that order so these are very low cost products but still the evita if you look at it's few billion dollars all right low margins large numbers high volumes which is quite opposite to what comes out of frontier innovation the goal in frontier innovation is improving productivity and economic growth but goal in inclusive innovation is a noble one it is improving the lives of the people that is access and purchasing power and social harmony you know so the fundamentals differ here 
one needs to recognize this difference. So therefore, if one has to start making a change, let us say our university systems and our people who are engaged in frontier innovation also getting involved in inclusive innovation, there will have to be this dramatic shift in terms of uh, the way they think, the philosophy and so on and so forth. Now, then you will say, my God, such a change, why, why do we want to do that? The scientific community will not be bothered to get into that. That is not the case. That's what I want to prove. The scientific community is getting into it. Uh, for example, why are 90% of the world's products and services designed for 10% of the world's population? Who would have thought, uh, who, who, who do you think uh, would ask such a question? Obviously, we will ask, isn't it? Because we are bothered. <coughs> no, this question was asked by Stanford University. And they have a group on entrepreneurial design for extreme affordability. You know, and they do a student competition for the base of the economic pyramid grand challenges. Stanford University, not University of Delhi or University of Pune or University of Hyderabad. Stanford University. Uh, they looked at this problem. For example, 20 million premature babies are born every year. And uh, they created, and they die. They die because uh, 450 of them die each hour because $2,000 is the cost of one traditional hospital incubator, which you can't afford. So they created a $25 incubator, by the way, by using what are called as phase changing fluids, basically. This is the problem bag that you see and therefore they made a paradigm shift. A baby is born in a hospital and if it is premature, it is moved to an incubator and where is that incubator? In the hospital. But if the baby is born in a hut, do you think you can move it to that incubator in the hospital? No. So what is the new model now? You have an incubator which comes to the hut. See the other way around, all right? And this is something that got the Economist Award uh, 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 this year for conceiving this, and you can see what difference it will make for uh, for, 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 for people in the uh, remote parts of the developing world. Uh, so basically, I think we have to look at making high technology work for affordable access, like quantum dots for affordable point of care disease diagnostic devices and there is work that is going on on this. I think the point I want to re-emphasize again and again is that it is not less for less, it is more from less. And when I say more from less, more excellence to more high technology, so as to say. Uh, look at, uh, we, we talked just now about McKinsey coming out with a report uh, on disruptive technologies. Uh, mobile internet and uh, cloud computing and uh, next gen genomics and advanced robotics and uh, you know 3d printing and so on so we will think that all these advanced technologies that are coming up oh they are up there and one day they will come here after they get maturing etc so when you look at 3d printing for example this is the three dimensional interviewing uh, biology and electronics to generate a bionic ear for example very sophisticated we can understand. Uh, similarly, what NASA is doing, a rocket engine part, by the way, which can stand 1500 degrees centigrade temperature. Fine. These are all sophisticated. But can you believe it that uh, we have a situation where garbage is getting collected with 3D printing? And where? This is in Pune. Just see this garbage collector. Just see the way they are sorting out the high density polythene creating granules and doing 3D printing to create sophisticated parts. We always think that high technology cannot be linked to problems like this. I'm sorry we have to change our ideas. And what difference it is making? It is getting more from less for more people. Because if you just collect plastic waste, you get 20 cents per kilogram. If you create separated plastic, you get 80 cents per kilogram. And if you create a photoprint uh, uh, and the purchase the green filament which is created out of uh, this uh, 3D printing, you get five dollars per kilogram. You can see, and in fact, this photoprint fellows say this allows the waste picker unions to leverage our low cost technology and provide them with sustainable source of income. You can see that. 
So getting more from less for more is also using advanced technology, not just ordinary technology. What we need to do for inclusive innovation, if it has to uh, sort of Indian inclusive innovation movement, supposing we have to launch, what do we have to do? First is mindset. The policy makers, science, technology, innovation, community, business sector, citizens, you know, there has to be a mindset change. <coughs> the second, there have to be government policies that are conducive to support inclusive innovation. And then finally, we require leaders with a difference, with their heart in the right place, all right? Heart in the right place because, you know, we always talk about innovation, no issue coming from here. Passion, passion from the belly, no issue. But there's a third thing, compassion in the heart. So we require leaders with innovation, compassion, and passion. Because it's only when you have compassion that you think of the have nots, not otherwise. All right? Otherwise, you are always looking at your own bottom line, your own top line. The conducive public policy, for example, you have to incentivize the public and private sector to undertake R&D leading to inclusive innovation. It's a hard job. The public procurement, guaranteed offtakes, price subsidy for inclusive innovation <coughs> products and services. Right? They are going to benefit the base of the economic pyramid, if you like. Fiscal incentives for inclusive innovation. National and global recognition for game-changing inclusive innovation. All right? We have to do a number of these things. And I'm very happy that Prime Minister's National Innovation Council, of which Sam Petroda is the chairman, I happen to be a member, has taken an initiative. And this is a photograph taken when our current president was the finance minister. And uh, we launched this Indian Inclusive Innovation Fund, uh, $1 billion in phases. It will support enterprises developing inclusive innovation solutions. And it's a for-profit entity with a focus on social investment. It will be a kind of a fund of funds, by the way. All right? Out of a $1 billion, $100 million is already on the table and it is shortly starting. Uh, <clears throat> then I talked about uh, inclusive innovation business per se, isn't it? You can create products which will benefit uh, uh, the resource poor people, uh, but in order to do that, you require leadership and you require strategic shift in terms of thinking. From what to what? From Technologically sophisticated, performance-rich products with many features is what we have been all used to. So from there, functional but high-quality products. Then the shift has to be from remove features to reduce costs, like I said, to reinventing the product from ground up. For example, Chotukul, the refrigerator that came up, Godrej, $69. Now, how do you do that? If the cooling was done by compressor, which is the conventional technology, they would have never been able to reduce the cost because compressor, after all, what is the lowest cost that you can get? So they said, cut compressor out and think of completely new solid state electronics, cheap solid state electronics for cooling in that uh, range. So you did ground up thinking, completely afraid thinking in order to create that. If you are just going to hold on to what you have and then try to tweak, you will get 10% difference. But we are looking at 10th fold difference. All right? Moving completely differently. Then we were premium price, high margins, from there to affordable price, high volumes. We were at technology push, product out approach, from there to customer centric, market based approach. The current markets, old money, no. New markets, new money. That means your philosophy, your strategy has to change. You are looking at a given pie and trying to get more and more share of the pie. No. You must say that the size of the pie will keep on increasing and you will look for new money. All right. So you can see there is a fundamental shift that you need to make. Just as I showed that scientists, how do they have to change their mindset? I am showing how business leaders have to change their mindset. Because unless these fundamentals are dealt with, inclusive innovation will not gain down. Use developed products to transform emerging markets? No. Build new global growth platforms based on emerging markets. Inclusive innovation leaders, <coughs> they will have to be different. 
set ambitious goals and stretch targets, allow teams to invent the means and reach out beyond the obvious industry practices, because if you use the obvious industry practices, you will never succeed. Invent next practices, not just best practices, all right? Because if you use the best practices, you will be where you are. You will be copying. Force project teams to be entrepreneurial and strategy as a stage. What is my man on the moon project? In every board meeting, one has to have a discussion. What is my man on the moon project, the new, a new project? You know, setting those sorts of goals. That is the leadership that we require. And as I say, combine innovation, passion, and compassion. Now, access equality despite income inequality. Looks impossible, but I've demonstrated to you it is possible. Social equity with business competitiveness. Looks impossible, but I've demonstrated to you that it becomes possible. <coughs> doing well by doing good. Looks impossible, because you know, previously what was our strategy? Doing well and doing good. <coughs> what does it mean? Doing well means Make a lot of money. Okay? <coughs> Thank you so much. Uh, make a lot of money, make a lot of profits, and then uh, create a foundation or a trust. Okay? So you are doing well and doing good. Here what I am saying is doing well by doing good. <clears throat> that means doing good itself becomes a business. Selling a low cost mobile handset itself becomes a business where you are making billions of dollars. That is doing well by doing good. Now, if I had projected these at the beginning of my lecture, you would not have believed that any of these are possible, right? But they have been all been possible because of inclusive innovation. And that is becoming <coughs> a global game changer. Let me end <coughs> by illustrating to you, I told you about what government needs to do, what X needs to do, Y needs to do. But individually also we can do things. So in my mother's name, I have created Anjani Marshalkar Inclusive Innovation Award. Anjani Marshalkar was her name. Uh, motivation for that was very simple. It's a small award, one lakh. Every year it is given. This will be the fourth year now. Uh, motivation was very simple, you know. Uh, she used to say, when you are poor, there is a challenge. When you are old, there is a challenge. If you are poor and old, there is a big challenge. And if you are poor, old and a woman, God save you. So she said, do something about it. So that is why I set up this particular award. Not just for best practice, next practice, which can make a difference. This award last year was won by this young man, just 28 year old, Mishkin Inkavare. What did he do? He asked himself a question. I can understand why people die of cancer, but why should they die of anemia? And he found that uh, he went to a village and found the women were reluctant to give blood. They didn't like the prick of the needle. And even if the blood sample was taken, it had to go to the city. It would take two, three days to get the results, by which time it could be too late, and so on. So he asked a fundamental question. He said, why do you have to prick and take a blood? Why can't I have something non-invasive, which is just wrapped around a finger, and I know what is hemoglobin? And then he went to the Google and found that no such device existed. And he was very happy. <laughs> because, you know, young people always want to do things which nobody has done. Right? First to India, first to the world. You remember? I said he wanted something first to the world. And also innovators, they say, uh, are ones who do not know it cannot be done. Young people do not know it cannot be done. Uh, they don't know that it cannot be done. We know that it cannot be done, but they don't. So he was one belonging to that. He said, if something cannot be done, I will do it. And then secondly, he said, why should it cost 200 rupees? Why not 10 rupees? So 200 to 10 is affordable. And non-invasive is excellence, because you have to use some new technology, 
in order to do that, affordable XLR. So what did you do? This hemoglobin detection, the best practice to next practice, the best practice was invasive with needles. He said, no, non-invasive, no needles. Cost per test was $5, he said $0.2. Okay, these were the targets he said. And what do you see? Touch HP. He has created that. Now, the incredible part is that this is affordable action. This is the young man. He has used high technology there. What is called as photoplethysmography, coupled with spectrophotometry. Very sophisticated software, by the way. Photon scattering. I mean, it's, it's incredible the kind of cutting edge science and technology has put in. It is not Jugaad. It is not Jugaad. It is using cutting edge science and technology. And he reached those targets of 10 rupees per test and, you know, non invasive. In fact, I remember Mrs. Anuaga, the member of Rajya Sabha, was uh, there. The first year's awards were given by Naran Murthy. Second years by Anuaga and third years this year was Abhay Bang. You must have known he's a great man. And I remember she was giving him the award, as you saw the photograph. And he, before that, he brought that device, put it around her finger, said 12.7, take care. <laughs> now you can just see what difference it is going to make in our villages. Maybe Latin America, maybe Africa, maybe all over the world, actually. Not best practice, next practice, but belonging to the affordable excellence category. The first year's award went to Trinetra. It does intelligent integrated pre-screening of Thermomati and uh, detects five major eye elements, cataract, diabetic retina, etc. Does it at one-tenth of the cost? But they did not get the award because of that. Shyam Vasudeva got the award because of something else. You know what was that? He went to villages in, I mean, the slums in Bombay and found he wanted to test it out, you know. Nobody from slum came to him. So then he went into depth and found out why they are not coming. And you know what he found was interesting. So when you go for these eye tests, you put that drop, you know, to dilate the pupil and so on. Then what happens? For three to four hours, you are very fuzzy. You can't do anything. Now, for you and me, it doesn't matter. But for that slum dweller, who depends on the daily wages, he can't work that day. And his children might go hungry. So he said, why do I have to put the drop to do the dilation? Can I not find some technique by which I don't do the dilation? And can you believe it? He had a breakthrough by which, without dilation, he can do it now. And which is very unique. And it was exhibited, by the way, Vilasra Deshmukh, Minister of Science and Technology, was alive at that time. Hillary Clinton came and saw that. And Hillary Clinton said, oh my God, we don't have it in US, what you have. We don't have it in US. Can you sort of uh, help us get it there? I was so proud to hear that. Because bulk of the time, we are copying what they have done. And here is Hillary Clinton saying, we don't have it. Can you give it? This example, the second example that I gave, and these are all young people, by the way, 28. And this year's award winner is also 28, strangely. <laughs> you know, and I'm delighted to see this new India because there is so much of negativism that you see in newspapers nowadays, isn't it? This is not working, that's not working, etc. I don't know, somehow or other, I always come across things that are working. You know? <laughs> in fact, I often said we require a good news newspaper. We are on the front page, only good news will be. There was some other dialogue, <laughs> the, the, the rest of it. We are, we, are, we are used to that, you know, basically. So I think there is plenty of such good news that is happening. And particularly I'm happy that it is happening in the area of affordable excellence. Uh, I would want to end my lecture by showing you something which actually uh, will tell you about what the ultimate message of this lecture is. Look at uh, this fellow, he has lost his feet, unfortunate, and he's wearing a $12,000 foot. You know, very sophisticated, okay? Now, if you look at 2.6 billion people, their income levels are less than $2 a day, they can't afford that, obviously, isn't it? 6,000 days wage will be required in order to do that. So what does India do? 
it creates a $28 foot, the Jaipur foot. And Time puts it on the cover page, saying the global scourge of landmines left thousand rimless, and then two gifted Indians developed this $28 foot. Now, what is the challenge of this $28 foot? <coughs> it has to be 10 times better than American. 10 times better than American foot. You know why? First, the Indian walks barefoot, not the American. Indian stands in a paddy field the whole day, and American doesn't. Indian walks on rocky soils and all sorts of uneven surfaces. American, as you saw, walks on a pavement, which is smooth. An Indian climbs a tree, and then he jumps from the tree. So you can see what stresses will be put there. So therefore, performance-wise, it has to be 10 times better, but the cost-wise, it cannot be $12,000. It can't be even $120. It has to be $20. You can see affordable and excellent means extreme affordable and extreme excellence. Okay? Can we achieve that? Yes. You can see how this has been achieved. Oh. Just a moment. I think there's something wrong in the... I'll, I'll get it for you. Just see how he is climbing. And to see the flexural strength, all right? He's able to bend, very sophisticated. And see he jumps. You can see the kind of space it must have created. And now you see something interesting. I hope you read that. He ran a kilometer in 4 minutes 30 seconds. And then a normal life. So as to say. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, this is the story of affordable excellence. You could see the excellence in terms of the performance, whether it's jumping, running, this, that and the other in terms of, all right, and affordability because it is just $20. I want to ask you a question. He ran that kilometer in 4 minutes 30 seconds. How many of you can run a kilometer in 4 minutes 30 seconds? And here is an honest disclosure, I can't. Please raise your hands. There must be at least one, come on. Am I seeing one? Ah, there, there, there is one. Oh, th thank you for saving the day for me. So, all right. So, in this audience, we have one. And I don't know, let's say there are 100 people in this audience. So, you can just see. Uh, how many will be there? 175. 175. 175. What it means is that this fellow can beat 174 of you. Now just imagine, you are giving him that $12,000 foot. You would not have afforded it, so you would have just, for that kilometer what would have done, he would have crawled and would have taken hours. And by giving him something which belongs to the category of affordable excellence, you have made him beat 174 of you. Now that analogy, of that foot, you can extend to other products. It could be an affordable diagnostics, for example, by which the father of a family of five, a poor fellow, knows on the very first day what is wrong with him. And he's back on his feet rather than lying in the bed for a month, saving the family. Therefore, the issue of creating something which is of a very high quality, but which is affordable, Creating affordable excellence and giving, despite income inequality, access equality is so important. 
And I've given you examples after examples from different walks, right from mobiles to... So if we can extend it to access to education, access to health, access to financial services, right? That's what we were discussing a little earlier. Um, access to communication, access uh, to transport, and whole range of things, you can see the world will change. And the combination of affordable excellence is again very important because affordability brings equity and excellence can bring competitiveness. And normally competitiveness and equity don't go together. All right? So that is the new paradigm. And that is why there are 386,000 plus hits on that little lecture. The whole world, basically, as I began and as I finished, 500 people around the world must have watched that, uh, that video today. And that message is spreading very, very rapidly for uh, different reasons. And I'm very proud, as an Indian, that India is showing the way to the rest of the world on affordable excellence. Thank you. Agreed to take a couple of questions if you have. like CSR 800 program is meant for 800 million people whose income levels are less than two dollars a day all right and uh, how in all these sectors education health and other things you can make a difference uh, this year's Infosys science award winner you know that 50 lakh award Virgopal Rao who got it he not only got it for uh, the papers that he had written but a very uh, interesting device he has created by using nanotechnology uh, in a nanotechnology center in IIT Bombay, which is very affordable, very cheap, but it gives you an indication of onset of a heart attack, basically. You know, just uh, that award has been given. Personally, I believe that there are scattered efforts that are going on. I have been after creating an Indian inclusive innovation movement across the country. Because uh, I can't show, just show one Mishkin Ingawale example and one Sham Vasudeva example and say that now everything is happening. No, sorry. We recall tens of thousands of Mishkins, tens of thousands uh, of, of Sham Vasudeva. And Prime Minister's Inclusive Innovation Council is trying to do that. That is where that fund of a billion dollar that I talked about, out of which hundred million dollar is in place. So that funding starts going because many times you know that research is driven by what funding is available in what sort of uh, uh, sector. But to be honest with you, to give the correct answer, if this is happening in the uni Indian universities to the extent it should happen, no, it is not. I'm very disappointed because the choice of problems is always, as uh, I was discussing, problem that can be solved rather than those that need to be solved. You know, we need to give that direction. Thank you.
done both topics. And uh, my, my point is that uh, while investing huge amounts in uh, research and development, if they cut the cost control, uh, by, if they cut their cost, they will be able to achieve this in inclusive innovation. Well, to, encourage, to encourage these corporates, is there any strategy that they can No, I think there are two separate issues. One is uh, to look at inclusive business itself as a business. Okay? That means doing good as a business, as I said, basically. You see, where, as I said, paradigm shifts have to be made. You know, I said current versus future. And in that future, your ability to make money on the basis of high volume, high numbers, but low margins. People are in a hurry. So what they try to do is high margins, low volumes, make quick money. Okay? But this process of high volume, low margins, reaching out is a more painful process. And that requires sort of compassion in the heart. You, you get the point. For example, Ratan Tata created Nano, not because he saw business, because he saw that lady up there, you know, I mean, that was how it was sort of triggered. He said, why can't she have a car? And it's been a game changer now. Because now after that car came, there's a new narrow car segment around the world where people are working on small cars. But not necessarily one lakh, but essentially small cars because they were going for bigger and bigger, more from more. Suddenly they are coming to more from less. So you require leadership of that kind where you say that I will go for it. It just doesn't uh, happen otherwise. The second point I like to make is that now, you know, the 2% of the net profit has to go in social corporate responsibility. And within social corporate responsibility, social inclusion is considered an important part. Now that 2%, when I had done a calculation, it comes to 26,000 crore. That's how money is available now. And can we direct some of that part, basically to doing innovations like this? It's very critical. And I personally believe that if you are able to do that, you will see uh, so, sort of a huge change. Particularly in the health sector, by the way, because there are two critical things for India. One is education, easy access to education, affordable access, and second is health. Isn't it? These are the two fundamental uh, sort of parameters. And I think in this, both these spaces, we need to sort of invest that sort of money. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's a very good question. Uh, see, it is like this. Uh, a rupee saved is a rupee earned, isn't it? I mean, India produces fruits and vegetables and 40% of them are wasted. What are we talking about? It can feed some nations, basically. You know, We are a very wasteful country, yeah, by the way. <laughs> we are wasteful of our time. You can see... But the people just chatting, I don't know, some or the other, it doesn't come naturally to me. I'm a 24 into 7 guy, basically. So, I, I, I don't know. People waste energy. You see television. Take one issue on which all the channels for six hours. Huh? And that will go on for four days and then you will forget. And then you are more to, is this the right way of utilizing the resource? What you are talking about is a broad principle where the country gets conscious of the fact that not a second will be wasted, not a rupee will be wasted, not a gram will be wasted, not a... You, you get my point. So it's a question of getting more from less, isn't it, from everything that you do. And that has to become a principle in every organization, every institution, every enterprise. 
And that is why you will see uh, awards that are given where you invite ideas from people on how to minimize the wastage and how to maximize, uh, uh, let us say, the output. In fact, I remember I'm the chairman of uh, several innovation councils in industry, by the way. I chair India's National Innovation Foundation, but I'm also chairman of Reliance Innovation Council, uh, chairman of Thermax Innovation Council, chairman of KPIT Technologies Innovation Council, chairman of Merico Innovation Foundation. And everywhere, this is being brought in. For example, in the Reliance, we have launched uh, what is called the Mission Kurukshetra at a point in time, where the three principles were, one, war on waste, war on waste. Second was value maximization. And third was extreme efficiency. One, two, three. Can you see? It fits in exactly with what we are saying, basically. And people were applauded, rewarded, incentivized for getting ideas out by which this can be done. I see no reason why it cannot be done in every enterprise. I see no reason why it cannot be done in every institution. You know, I mean, if you just uh, put value to what we waste, it's billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. One last question. Uh, my name is Lalit. I'm part of the Community Cloud Initiative. Couple of questions. Uh, what keeps you motivated? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I think uh, I have a simple philosophy. See, millennia have gone by, and uh, we come into this world. I came into this world on 1st January 1943. I'm 70, so I don't know how many years I left. And it's a very short span of time, you know. You come and go. But when you go, you have to leave something behind. <coughs> Make a difference, isn't it? Einstein made a difference. Newton made a difference. Faraday made a difference. Isn't it? So similarly, you must make a difference. Not difference to your bank balance. <laughs> but to the bank balance of the country. You get my point? Making some difference to the society. Uh, just now it was mentioned, I fought the turmeric battle, right? Wound healing properties, which my mother knew, my mother's mother knew, America patented. How many people would have read this? The same news item, which came in Times of India, written by one N. Suresh, must have been read by lakhs of readers. But there was only one who said, no, I'm going to fight it. Why? Because there was a sense of national pride. How can they do that? This is my ancestor's knowledge. All right, so I went out and did it, basically. And I remember after the victory, you know, India also celebrates, uh, uh, <laughs> celebrates uh, right beyond proportion. So I was celebrated. You know, it was not a difficult battle to win, to be honest. You know, Basmati was more difficult. But anyway, I was felicitated. And <coughs> Professor Gangadhar Gargil, who is a professor of economics, he knows I'm a scientist. So this issue doesn't belong to me, you know. Uh, it belongs to Ministry of Industrial Policy Promotion. Patents are handled by them, not by me. So he asked me, I understand the government, why did you fight it? And I simply said, because I'm an Indian. <laughs> I think if you ask me the challenge before India is the following. If each one of us, before going to bed, 1.2 billion people, say, my India, three times, and also ask a question, what did I do for my India today? Just 30 seconds, India will change. I do that. Every day I ask myself, what did I do for my India today? You know? So if you do that, that keeps you motivated. And then you don't look for things, by the way, in life. That's very important. The psychic income that you get is more than all the physical income in the world that you can get, by the way, for having done something that is uh, uh, that is good. That's what keeps me motivated. Uh, you could ask one more. Uh, any message to the banking technology? Ah, <laughs> well, I, you know, this is a, a, a sort of area that I don't know uh, much about at all. All that I would say is that uh, what I say is generically true, that uh, uh, technology is making a big difference to everything that we do. 
is going to okay. make a difference, for example, the way we learn, isn't it? Dramatic change, basically. And we have to recognize that early now. In fact, I was addressing a gathering of teachers on the other day. And I said, please, for heaven's sake, you realize now that the students will come to your class will be smarter than you and more informed than you, basically. And you have to change, uh, make a paradigm shift in this thing. It's the same thing in health, for example, the delivery methods changing thanks to technology, communication, everything is changing. And banking is no exception at all. I mean, we went to banks where 30 people were there, now there are no, not even three people. ATMs came, now mobile banking. It is going through some uh, issues at the moment, but I'm sure they will be resolved and so on and so forth. So as these technological advances take place, and like I said, there are many of them are completely disruptive, how our banking system will change? Vis-a-vis -vis delivering services which are affordable, reliable, secure, and how uh, technology can help in that. As a technology guy, I, I think there is an enormous scope. And I'm very proud to see, by the way, what uh, uh, is being done. I, I had uh, uh, two hours of extensive discussion uh, with uh, uh, three of them uh, since uh, morning. I, I would personally like to see India emerge as a leader in, in, in banking technology. And you're right up here to take the lead. Thank you.